Welcome to today's Westwards Masterclass. I'm James Roy, I'm your host today. And today I'm gonna to be speaking with John Larkin. Now John, I've known John for a long time. Uh, he's a multi-award winning author. His novel that came out in 2012 called The Shadow Girl won the Victorian Premier's Literary Award. Uh, and his book, The Pause, won the 2015 Queensland Literary Award. And he's also been shortlisted for the CBC Book of the Year Award for older readers for the same book. He's currently the writer in residence at Knox Grammar School uh, and also at University of Technology in Sydney and also at Scrummer School. Somehow he's managed to jag three of these writers in residence and still remaining in lockdown. I don't know how that works. Um, he tells me he just, he loathes adverbs, um, but he is deliriously happily married and has five children. Um, here's the other thing about John. Uh, John, you probably won't mention this in, in our podcast, but he, he, you do need to know that he's actually a fairly handy football player, soccer player. Um, one of my, one of the great pleasures in in my memories of John is watching him carve up single handedly. Well, it was him and me to be honest. Uh, carve, carve up a group of about fifteen uh, high school kids with a soccer ball. Um, I didn't do anything. I just stood there and went, "Go, John. How are you, John? I'm good. It's nice to hear that memory. I'd forgotten all about that. I couldn't do it now, though, James. I've got a severe to crippling osteoarthritis in both knees and my right hip, which needs immediate replacement. So, oh, well, that, 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 um, that if you want to call those kids back, I mean, I'm sure they'd smash it this time. Well, you could maybe get a, in that case, you could probably get a gig with a striker for my football club, Newcastle United. <laughs> so anyway, look, we're, we're, we're struggling today with some low bandwidth, but we're going to, we're going to crack on and see how we get on. So today, John, I, um, I wanted to talk to you about um, how you create rising tension in, in your work because I've, I've seen you talk about this before and I was, I, was, I was fascinated to see the way you unpacked things like having two characters who are at opposition with, with each other and how that creates tension and so forth. But um, let's start with, uh, with your approach to rising tension. What, what do you think is the most important part of um, how we approach rising tension in our stories? Uh, no, it's just something... I suppose as writers, we don't think about it overtly. We do it almost through, it's through osmosis, I suppose. It's like, for me, if you have two characters, you, you have a, a binary opposite position. One character wants this, one character wants that. This character wants that character's death. Um, this character wants to survive. So you just kind of throw them into the pit and sort of see what happens without without revealing too much i always think tension works better when you don't overly reveal it i i always say to my students is that the the um the idea of what's going bump in the night is far more terrifying than the realization of what is actually going bump in the night so you know as you're thinking that like if you're at home you hear something in the ceiling now, as a kid, you think that's like a headless zombie with a chainsaw and it just gets worse and worse as your imagination kicks in. In reality, it's probably a possum or your, or your cat or some other um, creature. But um, And I always like to play with that idea. What is there? What is that thing behind the curtain? If you like? One of the things I've heard, a story that I've heard you tell many times is the um, about a possum, in fact, and... The one that uh, I don't know if you if you can tell that story quickly. If there is any any point to tell that story, that in years. Well, it's a good yeah, story. I the possum story. Yeah. Everywhere I used to go, people say, "Tell tell the possum story." To the point, it was sort of hanging around my neck, so I, I completely dumped it. <laughs> you want well, to tell it for us the, now? The cut down version is that in my former home, I'd be um, I'd be riding away, and then. There was, a, there was a large tree position just next to my study and my study had a kind of tin roof and then I'd hear this possum every night go galloping along it, then be like a moment's silence as the possum was travelling through the air and then you'd hear a kind of kush as it grabbed on the leaves and that was all going well until one day I got out there and pruned the tree because it was a pretty horrible looking thing and I pruned it. Pretty much adopted a scorched earth policy, well, my chainsaw and I did. And then that night I was riding away and then I heard the possum start doing doing its takeoff run. I went, oh crap, the possum doesn't know the tree's not there. And I heard the possum's uh, thudding and then it took off and then I heard this silence as it's, sort of, it's flying through the air, uh, Keanu Reeves style in the Matrix and then there was a distant thud 
as it connected with the earth. <laughs> so it's like classic look before you leap moment for, for things in the possum world. But yeah. I guess the reason I, I bring that up is because, you know, you're talking about what is unseen is often better than what is actually seen, you know, what you, what you imagine. And, and it's not quite the same as what you're saying, but it is, it is connected, I think. Absolutely, because like for me, the greatest moment in that story, which I've never written, by the way, it's, it's always been a kind of uh, a presentation thing. That, the greatest moment in that story is when I have that realisation when I say, uh-oh, the possum doesn't know I've cut the tree down. And like kids are just rolling on the floor at that point because they've connected with what I'm thinking because they're already thinking this already. They just not verbalise it. And then when I verbalise it, so for me, that's the funniest moment or the best moment in that story, that realisation that things are about to go memory up for the possum. I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen the uh, the show No Activity, the um, stand show made by the guys from uh, Jungle, I think. But um, there's a fantastic scene in there where uh, this guy starts telling a story to his mate that he's holed up with in this sort of um, stakeout. But he starts telling a story, but he gets every element of the story out of order. And it, it makes absolutely no sense. Um, how does the, uh, the order in which you tell a story affect the rising tension? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's really, it's interesting because like we don't all write chronologically. Um, you think, yeah, how does the order uh, do any punch lines? And for me, the punch line was when the possum had that silence where it was flying through the air, but with nothing to grab onto. And I, I suppose at that moment, we all get inside the possum's head. And I can imagine that at that point, its eyes were as wide as like tea saucers or something like that. When it realised it's uh, it's safe in there, the tree has gone. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. The, the, the order of a story. Yeah, um, I suppose it's chronological to a degree, but um, I guess it's a thing that we do intuitively. A punchline doesn't necessarily have to come at the end, the funniest moment of the story. One of the things that I find annoying about jokes is you tell a joke, generally it's just it's just narrative, 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 narrative. And at the end, you've got the punchline, which is where the humour lies. I think what the Monty Python boys did best of all was give us the humour in the narrative with no punchline, which at that time was you know, unheard of. And so I've always tried to tap into that a bit myself. And that was, you know, kind, of, that was kind of followed up years later by... You know, a show that hasn't aged well, I have to say, in all sorts of ways. But fast forward the Australian TV show because they, the sketch show, because they had come up with this really simple way of getting around this idea of how do I we come up with a good punchline? Because they just go right. and it would be change. It would be like a change of the channel, and so you'd be going, right. where is this going yeah. to go? And then suddenly blink and we're unlo- you know, the opposite of this, I guess, is something like Saturday Night Live, where they insist on having this proper sketch that has waypoints and it goes for about four minutes which is usually about three and a half minutes too long yeah well if you think about like dad jokes there's nothing funny in the narrative it's only the punchline but you know day i went to um change my password on my laptop to uh to be stew and my computer replied say i can't do that because it wasn't strong enough there's nothing in there's nothing in that until we get to the punchline, because you kind of just sort of like, you're on this kind of nothing, 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 nothing. Yeah, it's kind of funny, but then the, the narrative itself is dull. So I think those of us who do work in sort of comedic area and writing, put the humour everywhere, not just in the punchline. Yeah, and of course, I think I think the dad joke is, is horribly undervalued. I think that people who, who bag out the dad joke just don't quite understand how empty their lives would be without them. Yeah, well, I told that. I, I tell some dad jokes. To I've got five children ranging from 17 to 22, and sometimes we're having a family dinner, and I will tell a dad joke, and I'll watch them try not to laugh because they just think they can't be laughing at dad's jokes, but they do. And sometimes I'll hit them, and they'll be creased up despite you know, not wanting to. But, yeah, the dad joke is greatly, is greatly undervalued in our society. So let's let's get back to this rising tension thing because I mean you, right. you, we we sort of touched briefly on the idea of the the possum and the and the tension rising in in because you know, you know what's what. coming that then becomes a structural thing though doesn't it our colleague and friend um, 
Archie Fasillo. He, he tells a story about his dad misunderstanding something and then punishing him for it with a boot up the backside. But he starts telling that story yeah. by saying, you realise I was the first Italian in space. And then he <laughs> tells the story. And so the whole time you kind of, the tension in that story is going, I don't see the connection yet. And then of course, when he gets the end, he goes, and that's when he booted me so hard that I became the first Italian in space. And that's sort of the payoff. How do you play with the structure in, in the way you write in terms of that sort of thing? I think the greatest story I can tell about the tension and, and how I realized when to use it. And it comes back to that thing where we say that thing that goes bump in the night is more terrifying than the realization of what's actually there. Take you back to my childhood. Uh, as a young boy, I could never sleep. I like to sleep in a darkened room, completely darkened room. But as a young boy, I liked my door closed, no lights on, but I always felt safe when I could see that thin strip of light at the bottom of the door. Because that thin strip of light represents safety. Someone's up there. Your parents are up looking out for you. Now, probably about nine, eight, nine years old, my parents went out to some sort of 70s party as parents used to do in the 70s can't imagine what they were doing there. But anyway, they went to these parties in the 70s. They were, they were ubiquitous. But my sister was meant to be babysitting me. She's a few years older. So my sister, who was a party animal herself, came into my room and said, listen, loser, I'm going to a party myself. Don't tell mum and dad or I'll stab you with this sharpened chopstick. So off she went to her party. And I'm left alone in this dark house, completely by myself, eight, nine years old, and I looked at the door you know, for this thin strip of safety light and it wasn't there, of course, because everyone had gone out. So I crawled out of bed, crawled along the floor because, it, you know, you're safe from monsters if you've got a light in the house. And I went back to bed, closed the door. Now the beam of light coming onto the door almost blinded me. And, but I felt safe because the strip of light was on, even though no one was there. Anyway, I fell asleep. A little while later, I was, I was awake, awoken. And I looked back at the thin strip of safety light and there was two black lines about halfway up. There was someone or something outside my door. So, of course, I went straight under my doona because every child knows you're safe from monsters under the doonas. They won't attack you. It's in the monster constitution. But I plucked up the courage, looked back at the light and it was the two black lines were still there. Up I went again. This, this proceeded for about an hour. A little while later, I plucked up the courage. I said, Trish... Trish, is that you? Thinking my sister was standing outside my door to freak me out. And then I heard it. This little noise went, meow. My two cats were sitting outside my door, probably thinking this guy has access to milk. Whereas in my mind, it became a headless zombie with a chainsaw. And I, I think I realised at that point that the, the, black, the, the two black lines outside the door were far more terrifying than what was actually there, of course, which was nothing. It was a couple of cats. And so I've used that before, that, that thing of what might be there, that, that lack of realisation. And for me, James, the best way to explain that is in the film um, The Blair Witch Project. Now, I don't know if you've seen The Blair Witch Project, but for me that worked brilliantly because the horror takes place off screen and your mind just goes into overdrive as to what's happening off screen. So if you think about what actually happens on the screen, scary in that film, well, there was absolutely nothing. But it's all happening off screen. Well, I mean, that's we've we've discussed this before in in, in conversation. But um, the idea that the movie Jaws only became properly terrifying right up to the point where we actually saw the fake shark. But prior to that, just the the movement in the water and the the, the music and all that sort of thing was far more powerful than a big fake shark that was clearly made up when we finally saw it right yeah so that worked brilliantly because the mechanic there was no cgi back in 1977 or whenever it was made and so they had a mechanical shark which was rubbish didn't work and so spielberg shot around the shark so he had the idea of the shark not the actual shark of course but when it jumps on the boat in the end and starts eating quinn hull you can almost see made in hong kong written down the side of the shark because it ceased at that point it ceased to become terrifying even though he was eating Quint alive. But it's that below the surface, that's a terrifying one, which they realise they probably should have done the whole movie like that. I don't know if you've seen the movie um, Free Solo. Is that the climbing of the mountain without 
Mm. Where they map it out, you, right? And he, and yeah, he so. climbs. The guy climbs it. Climbs um, Half Dome or El Cap or one of these um, a yeah. kilometre high without any ropes. And he did a he did a promotional tour after the movie came out. So he clearly survived. He clearly doesn't die on the side of the mountain. Right. But I yeah. watched that entire film from between my fingers because it was so immensely terrifying the idea that he might die even though i knew he hadn't how do you how do you think you know in writing we can create that level of suspension of disbelief yeah it's an interesting point because like like you, you mentioned before my book the shadow girl like we know in in the second chapter that she survives of course okay we know she's we, we know she survives and yet it's terrifying to think she's not going to survive when we go to her backstory because so much happens to her. And I suppose at that point you're thinking, not does it, it's not enough for her to just survive. You want her to prosper. You want her not to be hurt. And, and that's what I kept doing was like, I kept pushing the boundaries of what more can I do to this character? And even though we did know, like the gentleman climbing the mountain, that we know he lived because he's there telling it retrospectively. The same thing happened, yet the tension is still there. I guess because we, we also un we understand, perhaps better than we once did, we understand that the emotional scars and the emotional trauma and the psychological trauma that, are, that happens from events that occur to us are in many ways as bad as any physical thing that can happen to us. Well, in many respects, psychological abuse is worse and we're hoping she'll get out of this situation unscathed and I think that's what we're we're banking on how does she get out of this situation? How does my character possibly survive when, when this happens? Even today, my wife and I are watching Blacklist and we just discovered Blacklist during this lock-in period and we're absolutely loving it. But there's one scene where um, the, the female protagonist is married to this guy who's, uh, who's, who's obviously a spy himself, sent to spy on her. And uh, they have this fight. My wife couldn't stay any longer because she was that scared. My wife actually ran out of our bedroom to go and bring some clothes in. And uh, I thought, well, she knows because she, she's the protagonist. She's not going to die. But still, my wife felt that empathetic towards her. She, she ran out of the room. And that, yeah. that, I guess that's the key, isn't it? The, the idea of empathy. And this is maybe slightly off topic, but this we, I was saying to someone the other day that feels like we're in the age of the, um, the anti-hero in some way. I mean, you've got, certainly in this golden age of TV, we've got the people who we know we shouldn't be rooting for, like um, you know, House of Cards and... Uh, and um, Tony Soprano. Tony Soprano, great example. Um, a guy who represents everything we despise in a person or everything we should despise, and yet we're kind of in their corner because he is basically just trying to keep his family happy and keep things together and, and so forth. Did you watch Sopranos all the way to the end? Yes. For me, like, he's, he's an absolute, like the Kevin Spacey character. And then when you bring in Kevin Spacey's private life, and you watch that in the knowledge of some of the things he did, it almost does, of course, it does matter what he did, but you're still invested in that character. You, you, you paid an emotional price to go on this journey with him. And as despicable as he is, you're still there with him. It, it, like you say, it's an anti-hero. Uh, as for Tony Soprano, horrible, horrible, disgusting human being. Yet he has good qualities. He loves his kids. I mean, who doesn't love their kids? We're biologically... Uh, uh, attuned to all our kids, otherwise we, you know, we, we, we'd be eating them like Komodo dragons. Uh, no, we wouldn't do that. But um, but like you say, antiheroes. How do we invest in an antihero? But if, if if anyone if anyone is planning to watch uh, Sopranos to completion, um, they might want to kind of close their ears just for a moment. But I want to talk about the last scene where, which a lot of people have criticised hugely. They say, oh, you know, because. For those who haven't seen it, Tony Soprano, he and his family are in a cafe or a restaurant in the evening. We have a glimpse at a couple of people coming. His, his daughter's just parked the car. She's coming, coming across the street towards the restaurant. His son's just arrived. There's a guy looking a bit seedy at the bar. He and his wife are looking at each other, having a conversation. The guy at the bar gets up and walks across the room and goes into the bathroom. And there's a couple of other people who you look at. And, and there's all these red herrings set up, but you don't know which one's a red herring. And then as just in the very last moment, we hear a bit of a sound and he looks up 
and then that's the end of this incredible show, all episodes. Could and and of course there are many options as to what could have actually been what that kind of sound could have been. Was he about to get shot? Was his son about to get hit by a car? Like, what, what was your take on that? It was I, I didn't see any other other way they could have finished it, but a lot of people found it a bit unsatisfying. Yeah, I think people probably struggled with the lack of resolution, and yet the lack of resolution wasn't itself a resolution because it, it kind of ends how you want it to end. Or I suppose if you're cynical, that they're leaving it open to do a Sopranos movie, and I can't do it now because of the James Gandolfini's passing. But uh, I actually thought the ending was perfect mm. I, I, because it leaves you thinking, "What happened?" and it leaves you on that cliffhanger. And I think well, that's what we try to do at the end of each chapter. You want to make you want to make your reader keep on reading. But Sopranos took it to the next level by having an end at this cliffhanger moment. So you're going, "Well, no, what happened?" So it creates this whole other I suppose industry online as people are chatting about what what happened, what's going on. And I suppose that brings other people to into the Sopranos, into that into that narrative too. So I actually thought it was perfect. I guess it was also a concession, perhaps, by the writers that we couldn't let him necessarily win after he's done all these incredibly awful things for his, his show. We can't we can't let someone like that win. But at the same time, the bad guy doesn't always get sorted out does he yeah um good things happen to bad people for someone uh in that situation we just don't know we we there's something afoot but we don't know what it is we want to we want to look behind the screen and see what really happened so when it finished it finished over 10 years ago we're still having this conversation mm. and so that yeah. that's a healthy thing that the writers did they they kept that conversation alive and people will still come like your audience now who probably haven't uh Maybe even heard the Sopranos might go and started hunting it down now. Well, you, they they definitely should, and it, when they finish watching it, maybe they can let us know what actually happened to the Russian in the woods. <laughs> the Russian in the woods. You remember the Russian in the woods? He, I remember a, the Russian in the woods. He gets there's a spurt of blood yeah. as he gets shot, but we never they never find his body. I don't know. Nobody never got resolved. Yeah. Yeah. Shooting in snow is almost impossible because you've got pristine snow. Someone comes in for a scene, cut, go back. The snow's already trudged up. How do you do it? If, if I was directing that, I'd say, we're not shooting in snow. <laughs> no, that's we, right. do a one, we do a one, we do a single take. And just for, just to finish this kind of thread we're on, um, I think part of the genius of, um, of Game of Thrones, of George Martin, with when he starts eliminating really important characters very early on in the show, it kind of builds tension so that we know that it, no one is actually safe. Well, it's the same as like we all watch, I suppose, given the state we're not, our health fan, we watched, we watched Contagion the other night. Probably not, a good, probably not a great idea in the climate, but we watched it anyway. And you're watching a film where you've got Gwyneth Paltrow, major Hollywood star, Oscar winner. She's dead within five minutes. Then Kate Winslet turns up, another major Hollywood star, Titanic, the whole box and dive. I think she won an Oscar, I'm not sure. But she's dead within half an hour. So you think, well, that's it. All bets are off now. Anyway, good luck. The other thing I want to talk to you about, John, is I've, I've heard you talk about um, a fairly common kind of uh, scenario that you might see in a middle grade or a young adult book where you've got a person in authority, such as a principal or whatever, and someone who is in a position of uh, the opposite, like maybe the, 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 the child character. Um, you've got an interesting way of approaching this that surprises a lot of young people when they hear you do it. Can you talk us through that? Oh, for me, like controlled and I mean, for me, the greatest thing for a writer to do is a thing called anger and eloquence. Now, you can do that in writing because, you know, when you lose the plot in, in, in reality, you get angry, you get heated up and, and, and your words fail you. But as a writer, when you combine anger and eloquence, that's so powerful. But what you're talking about here, James, is when, if, say, uh, a, a character at school has done something wrong and maybe the school bully uh, or whatever, if the antagonist loses their plot and is yelling, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill you. That's not really a threat. But if that same person, the antagonist comes up to it, whispers in his ear, I'm going to kill you. Now, that is far more terrifying because that's, thought out, it's measured, rather than, say, someone screaming at someone 
in absolute anger, if that makes sense. It's like when a mafia boss, like in, in, in um, mafia, the bosses, the, the ultimate boss, he's got, he's got no physical threat himself. He's a weak little man, that's 60, 70. If he kisses someone on the cheek, it's, it's, you know, that's a symbol of affection for generally, but we know what that actually means. Um, that's the mafioso kiss off. That person is going to die. I'm going to die horribly. Um, so I, I kind of love playing with that, that controlled and, and meted out aggression as opposed to when you just lost the plot and you're screaming. So, John, um, you've spoken in the past about something. I've forgotten the name of it, but I remember you've got the name, a name for something that doesn't really have a, doesn't seem to have a proper name that you'll find in creative writing courses. What was that again? Remind me. All right. Okay. This, I think is so important. We don't have a name for it. It's that thing that keeps you reading, whether it's an investment in the character, investment in the story, investment in what's going to happen to my characters with that emotional investment, if you like. So it's, it's that thing that keeps you up late in the night. It's way past your bedtime. You might have to get an early flight in the morning. It's midnight in your hotel room, but you're going to keep on reading because you are having emotional investment. So I call that the story driver. It's that thing that keeps us going to find out, does the boy get the girl? Does, does the payoff come to fruition and so forth? So, John, uh, as is tradition uh, on our mini masterclasses, um, we give you an opportunity to give us your website um, in case anybody wants to track down your work or track you down. What, what's your website? I actually don't have a website. Don't have a website? Uh, I, no, I used to have a fan site, but that, that, I think a fan grew up <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and sort of shut the site down. Um, I've, I've met my fans and they're both lovely. Yeah, you have your, you have your uh, fan meeting in a phone booth. It's always handy. You can bring sandwiches. Uh, That's right. So if, if fans, I've always contactable through my publisher, Penguin Random House. If people are desperate to communicate with me, uh, they can do so via, via there. Um, that's the best way to do it. Uh, you're writing anything at the yeah. moment or are you just busy helping other people with their writing? Yeah, more that. I mean, I'm, I'm after, look, my, my book, my last book was a positive book about suicide. The one before that was about a homeless girl I met during the school talk. So I put a lot of emotional investment into those books. So I kind of wanted to breathe for a while and then just focus on uh, my family and, and teaching. But yeah, things are happening again. It's like we've both been through that same period, James. We both might have been quiet for uh, quite some time. And, and I think that's okay. It's okay to have hiatus. I don't have this rushed need desperately published straight away now. I'm not chasing the next book. I'm letting things happen slowly. Um, yeah. That's probably the right I always wanted to be. Yeah. Maybe we're publishing too many books because people are just trying to keep on top of the next, um, the next advance or whatever. And maybe people need to take a breath and write better. Yeah. I always think the Jean Dominic Borby approach is the best one to write. You know, the story of John Dominic Borby. No. He wrote the dot and go on the butterfly. Right. And he did it. Having gotten locked in syndrome, he could only blink. So he managed to blink a book by interpreting the blink. So um, an assistant would read out the letters of the alphabet and he would blink. When she got the one he wanted, he wrote an entire book that way. And he had pause for thought. I think a lot of our books, we wouldn't be flooded so much with so much rubbish if we actually took the time to blink our books or at least take that level of focus rather than just racing to get my next book on the shelf. Yeah, indeed. Listen, John Larkin, thank you so much for talking to us. Um, we will catch up again sometime in the future and have another chat. Always a joy, James. Lovely talking to you. Bye, everyone.